Welcome to today's IIEA seminar. Um, we're delighted to be joined today by Professor Quinn Slobodian, Slobodian Marion Butler McLean, Associate Professor of History of Ideas at Wellesley College. His topic today is crack up capitalism, profiting from fear in the time of the pandemic. So economic crisis, um, COVID, uh, world disruption, the future of capitalism, it's all there. Um, he's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we we'll move on to Q&A with our audience. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom on your screen there. And um, please feel free to send your questions throughout the session, and we'll come to them once Professor Slobodian has finished his presentation. Um, just to remind you that today's presentation and the Q&A are all on the record. Um, Please do join the discussion on Twitter as well, and please use the handle at IIEA. So now to introduce Professor Quinn Slobodian. He's the author of the book, Globalists, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism, where he traces ideas, unusual, lesser examined ideas about the origins of neoliberalism, right back to the, the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian empire and um, to strands of thought that, um, maybe are slightly unexpected, it was published by Harvard University Press in 2018 and offers an enormous amount of insight into um, the variety of ideas that we call neoliberalism in our current era. He's a visiting associate professor at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs for 2022. And Marion Butler McLean, uh, associate professor of the history of ideas at Wellesley College. He's also an associate fellow at Chatham House and co-director of the History and Political Economy Project funded by the Hewlett Foundation. And he has a new book coming out quite soon on capitalist exit fantasies, and it'll be out in 2023. So um, over to you, Professor Slobodian, on crack up capitalism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hardiman, and to the staff at the IEA for inviting me and giving me a chance to talk about some of this material. And some of it is related to things I've been publishing over the last year and a half or so. And it attempts to sort of get a perspective on this time of pandemic and disruption that is maybe a little bit different from the one that we usually hear. So it's kind of looking at it from the margins and kind of the somewhat radical far right fringes as we'll see in the next 20 minutes or so. But I'm happy to hear whatever reactions people have or sort of contributions they might have to this. Um, different way of understanding sort of the, the social symptoms of a time of uh, social re rearrangement. Now, clearly for most of us, you know, as I'm, I think I can speak for myself and probably most of the people on the call, the pandemic, since it took over our lives in March 2020, has been a time of isolation, hardship, um, illness, and for many people, uh, death, loss of relatives, um, loss of colleagues and loved ones. But for other people, of course, it's been a time of great economic opportunity and great economic enrichment. And one could speak probably, you know, most concretely to the historical surge of the stock market valuations of the last couple of years, the unprecedented year on year leap in the number of billionaires worldwide, the unprecedented returns and bonuses being reaped at the the hedge funds and the, the asset managing funds globally. Those are, I think, important topics, perhaps maybe even more important than what I'm gonna talk about today. But what I'm gonna talk about today is something a little bit more, um, again, on the margins is talking about sort of specific individuals who have managed to navigate the kind of waves of fear and panic produced by the pandemic to enrich, enrich themselves through articulating a kind of a novel form of politics. So drawing on the work that I've done, as I said, over the last year or two, I wanna talk about a few cases of what I think we're sort of provisionally calling a crack up capitalism. That is um, a form of economic activity propagated by people whose profit model and their kind of a normative vision of change and the, the social future relies on an idea of an accelerating process of social dissolution and an accelerating process of political fragmentation. So this is a, a form of, it's a sort of a, a profit model and a kind of a political vision 
that sees an acceleration in the near future and in the medium term future of processes of political crack up. The people I want to look at are first the entrepreneurs of so called startup societies who preach secession from existing nation states and the creation of private um, polities not governed by democracy, but simply through contract and private ownership. The second group um, we can call catastrophe libertarians of the gold bug community. So people who predict a monetary collapse and then sell you the means of fending off your own private tragedy in the form of gold bars, ETFs, gold shares, and gold coins. And then the third group are, uh, is a group that we've, me and my co-author Will Callison have called the movement hustlers of the so-called Corona skeptic community, where sort of esoteric entrepreneurs and self-branding tech gurus have managed to turn contrarian opposition to vaccination, lockdown, and mitigation measures into personal paydays for themselves. And I'm sure they're everyone listening has <laughs> their own personal version of the, the, the kind of personality that I have in mind when I say that. I think all three of these, even though they can look different in a certain way, exemplify a common dynamic, which we, we, should, we would do well to keep an eye on. That is, these investors and business leaders who, like war profiteers before them, know how to capitalize on crisis and also have it in their own interest to kind of give the crisis a nudge too when necessary. So even though, I mean, it's, I don't mean to sort of make the pandemic a closed story, clearly it's still ongoing, but I think it's possible already for us to start to sort of historicize it, to treat it as something that can be analyzed as the outcome of some sort of longer and short-term developments in the recent past and, and certain things that are still following us to the present. But it is that in this sort of funny space, right, where it's long enough ago now, early 2020, that it can feel like it's becoming a kind of an, an, an era that we have now spent some time in. It's not, we're not living in the sort of day-to-day -day headlines. We're starting to see sort of patterns emerging. And if you remember in the first months, those first months of 2020, much of the talk was about the kind of centralization of authority and the centralization of forces. There was this at least momentary idea that the nations were coming together against what then US President Trump called the invisible enemy, right? So although there was already a kind of a competitive aspect between who would have the fewest cases, who would have the fewest casualties, nonetheless, there were sort of this this common perspective of looking towards national leaders, assuming that central states were being reinforced by the need to um, deploy supplies, to enact rapid uh, measures, to overrun often private interests or business interests to make sure that people got what they needed. So there was this kind of centripetal force at first, right? This tending towards the center. People's eyes were locked on the leaders in crisis mode. And central agencies were giving forecasts, sending down lockdown measures from above. Um, you know, these figures like Anthony Fauci in the United States, every country had their own kind of medical guru who now became the voice of either, you know, reason or oppression, depending on your politics. Um, but almost inevitably, they were sitting somewhere next to the national leader, and we could see a kind of a centripetal direction of. Of, of political travel. But even then, you know, even when our eyes were kind of locked on the national leaders, there was also a kind of a centrifugal energy, right? Which was sometimes a little bit harder to notice. But there was an energy, a political and a social energy that was tending away from the center too. Think back to that sort of March, April, May time period. Suddenly local authorities became very prominent, right? Chinese mayors, US governors, Indian chief ministers. The uneven spread of the contagion was actually also leading to kind of subnational forms of containment um, and subnational sort of patterns of, of affliction and likely recovery. In the United States, this was, you know, this was uh, extraordinary. This was happening at an extraordinary level. The California governor, Gavin Newsom, called California a nation state at one point in the early months of the pandemic. The Washington governor, 
Jay Inslee accused his own commander in chief, the president, Donald J. Trump, of fomenting domestic rebellion because Trump was talking about, quote, liberating individual states from uh, COVID containment measures. So we saw this, this actual dramatic expression of the actual existing federalism of places like the United States and places like India as well. Um, in the US, the Maryland governor, in another example, confessed that he was actually keeping COVID tests in an undisclosed location under armed guard to prevent you know, Washington DC from seizing them and redistributing them more evenly across the political landscape. The different parts of the US broke up into so-called compacts for the purposes of governance, and in some cases, you know, um, differential right of movement. So you wouldn't be able to enter the one compact if you hadn't, if you had come from certain uh, high case states or you hadn't um, received uh, vaccinations and so on. Place like Vermont next to Massachusetts here kept these policies in place until relatively recently. So this is, you know, in, amidst the, the attempt to sort of tackle as a, as a species, this existential challenge of the pandemic and the virus, it was, it was easy to notice or forget sometimes, or easy to overlook the way that these sort of extraordinary experiments in subnational politics were actually underway at the same time. These were of course not happening sort of purely spontaneously. There were people who were attempting to kind of accelerate this tendency. And among those were some people who were actually sitting right in the White House. So there were a couple of, of economic advisors, Arthur Laffer and Stephen Moore. Arthur Laffer, you might know the name from the Laffer curve, um, the pseudo ideological, uh, pseudo intellectual justification for the large tax cuts of the early Reagan years, but also one of Trump's closest economic advisors. Um, he and his, and his co-author and, and collaborator, Stephen Moore, who works for the, um, the, the think tank ALEC, the American Legislative Executive Council, which is, has it in its interest to sort of deliver ready-made policy to Republican uh, Congress people to get put into law. What they tried to do in the course of the pandemic was just sort of set states against each other and to argue that um, the unwillingness to lift COVID measures, the unwillingness to roll back containment was going to hurt growth in states that made those choices. And if it was going to hurt growth, then they should not be receiving sort of certain benefits from the center. And the laggard anti-growth states of the blue democratic America would be sort of um, disadvantaged against the pro-growth, um, you know, anti-lockdown red states. So even as there is this language of the nation pulling itself together and so on, beyond the kind of forget about the kind of you know the, the black lives matter movement and the kind of street protests that were happening through 2020 that we can sometimes too easily forget when the biggest on the street protest movement in american history even at this sort of higher level level of policy there was an attempt to set subnational units against one another in a competition for scarce resources and for scarce mobile capital in some cases, for example, there was a great deal of movement from um, places like California to lower tax states like Nevada, Texas, and Florida. So there's this sort of much ballyhooed Texas from Silicon Valley to Miami as a new hub for especially things like uh, crypto. So there was a lot of sort of subnational movement happening um, and it wasn't happening organically or on its own, it was happening because there was an effort to kind of redeploy and um, scramble the, um, the concentrations of wealth and productive resources in the United States. So that is, you know, still, I would say within the realm of pretty standard, what you would call competitive federalism. You know, I don't, I would, I don't think we could call the decision of Elon Musk to move Tesla to Texas for low, reasons of low taxes sort of a symptom of crack up capitalism because it's more or less business as usual. The, the United States, especially the auto industry has been um, reshuffled over the last half century, largely by this logic of tax holidays, uh, leveraging public funds to um, better enrich private companies and to draw them um, from one place to the other. 
There were more radical examples, however, and those are the ones that I want to spend the rest of my time here talking about. One of the most kind of articulate exponents of a more radical form of what we think we could call crack up capitalism is someone who was a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, formal general partner at um, Andreas and Horowitz, which is one of the most important Silicon Valley venture capital funds. It's a fellow named Balaji Srinivasan, who has a very large social media following. He's sort of a celebrity of the, the tech uh, media world. Um, and he was also rather early in predicting the, um, the, uh, the radical outcome of the, the spread of COVID-19. So already, I think in February, he was saying that this thing is coming, we need to, we need to lock down now, we need to start putting on masks, et cetera, et cetera, um, which would be itself perhaps kind of admirable in the sense that he had the kind of foresight to um, see the, the, the sort of direction of travel for this epidemiological event. But where it becomes more notable is that he saw this as a, a kind of a chance to accelerate something he had already seen in the making in a while, which is the kind of breakup of centralized states altogether in a lasting way, i.e. not just short-term lockdown quarantine to prevent the spread of the virus, but he actually um, is a proponent of something called startup societies, which suggests the creation of new private polities on quote unquote virgin land, somewhere leased or bought from um, developing countries in which people could expatriate from the country that they're, they're currently living in, become citizens of this country and enter in a non-democratic form of contract-based um, affiliation. So effectively a kind of gated community, but as a country altogether. So this is something that he had been actively um, helping to promote and um, advocate for years, along with um, Patry Friedman, the grandson of Milton Friedman. Balaji Srinivasan had been involved with the, supporting the so-called seasteading movement mm -hmm. and so on. And it was very interesting to see in the early pandemic how he anticipated that the, that the effect of COVID-19 would be to kind of accelerate what, he's, what he saw as a kind of a hoped for fragmentation, that the effect of COVID would be to increase the mobility of certain factors of production. So mobile talent, mobile capital would start following um, the logic of the places that had locked down most effectively would become green zones that would suck in mobile talent capital. The places that had not would experience a kind of a capital flight or a kind of talent flight or a brain drain, making states ever more into kind of vendors and entrepreneurs of and you know doing everything they can to fashion themselves in a way to draw in the, um, the this uh, important small percentage of the world's population that was able to you know pull up stakes and reestablish themselves wherever they want um, without discomfort. So this was, of course, you know, something, a vision that has now been complicated by the, the difficulties of a zero COVID policy, for example, in, in China, Taiwan, and New Zealand, and Hong Kong. But at the time, it was, it was uh, notable, at least to me, because most of the world, you know, March, April, May 2020 was still in kind of panic mode, um, triage mode. And notably, someone like him was saying, this is actually an opportunity, and it could be this. Is the, this could be the chance that we've been waiting for to um, accelerate a movement into a kind of a post-national, um, uh, much more kind of uh, fractal, as he likes to put it, uh, landscape of options for a kind of larger palette of policy options for the mobile um, millionaire and entrepreneur. This was picked up on by people who do things like rankings for world passports, uh, you know, who predicted that, the, that COVID would spark a sort of step shift in global mobility, uh, increasing the movement of people who wanted to secure second passports or the ability to um, relocate. You know, it's, it, it has indeed taken on a different color now when, for example, people are trying to get out of China because they are locking down and containing the virus so well. 
So one can see how there's um, things have not turned out as this as this group has hoped for, but it is notable that they thought that 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 the pandemic itself would serve as a kind of a rocket fuel towards a uh, a fragmentation process that had in many ways had been happening across what we call the sort of neoliberal era over the last 40 to 50 years. Another set of, of crack up capitalists that I followed a bit in my work and that I, that I wanted to say something about is people who were specifically involved as precious metals consultants or in the business of, of selling gold and, and gold backed assets in various forms. This group of people, you know, collectively called gold bugs insofar as this, if this is a belief that they have and not just a line of work that they happen to be involved in, um, is a kind of a longstanding strain of libertarianism, which is itself quite interesting in that it got a big bump after the end of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970 when the US closed the gold window. In other words, stopped making um, the US dollar convertible freely to gold. The price of gold went way up. The a, a subculture was produced within which the belief was that paper money, fiat money, money not backed by precious metals, was simply a kind of a means of politicians to buy off favors from the electorate that the printing presses, so to speak, would be run forever by these quote unquote socialist politicians to you know, buy off poor, poor people's votes, buy off minority people's votes. Um, hand off money to their to their crony capitalist partners within the business community and that the world according to the gold bug since the end of the Bretton wood system has been the buildup of this sort of paper mountain of fiat currency which at some point will be set ablaze leaving the world in ashes and only people who have left the sort of um, the concrete token of value i.e gold that has been recognized for thousands of years and so on, as they say, as a store of value, only the people left holding gold will be the ones who can sort of survive in this ashes of this monetary apocalypse. I am not exaggerating in the rhetoric that I'm using. This is, this is the kind of way they talk about things. The 2008 financial crisis indeed gave a big push to gold bugs. They got renewed relevance within sort of fringe communities, the internet, has provided a wonderful new platform to kind of push this idea that things like quantitative easing, things like zero interest rate policy are ways for people in power to just keep themselves in power and at the expense of the, um, the long-term effective collapse of the economy and society. So when the pandemic hit, the gold bugs were kind of, um, rubbing their hands because it was now clear that the, 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 the moment had come, the moment they had predicted. One place that I followed this specifically, although I think you could follow this in most countries, the place I looked at it was in Germany. And in 2020, it, it, there was just this sort of flood of books called things like um, The Greatest Crash of All Time, How You Can Still Protect Your Money, The World Before the Greatest Economic Crisis of All Time, The Crash Is Here, what you have to do now, exclamation point, world system crash, the crash is the solution, dot, 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 you know, I could go on and on and on. And these were not marginal books, right? These were actually bestsellers on Amazon in, in Germany. And they all basically promised the same thing, which is if you want to protect yourself and shield yourself from this now, you know, currently occurring collapse in 2020, then you need to, as quickly as possible, get yourself to the precious metals real retailer that in many cases these authors either consult for or work directly for and you know buy gold ingots buy gold bars buy gold coins of course if you tried to do that in early 2020 you would find that they there was such a run on things like gold ingots and gold bars that you could actually couldn't get your hands on them um, there were long lines you know when the stores were still open at the gold retailers of a place like degusa for example in germany and um, the, the, uh, the effect was, you know, the sense of desperation for people who felt now that the gold bug 
uh, fear mongering had been confirmed and that now one had, you know, only to sort of cling to the possibility of sort of, of accessing some of those last remaining, <laughs> those last remaining um, wafers or, or bars or ingots that, that were still available out there, it often being paid, bought at a, at a great premium, right? The gold price did rise by about a third over the course of 2020, it has gone up and down since then, but has um, remained at a much higher level as it was before the pandemic. So within the community of gold retailers, gold consultants, there are some, you know, properly well-read kind of ideologues, one of whom is a fellow named Marcus Kral, who um, Germans might have heard of if there's any Germans in the audience. But he was sort of recognized by the far right in Germany as the kind of, um, you know, the Friedrich Hayek of their movement, the alternative for Germany, the right-wing party, which is a close has had a close working relationship with the gold bug community, um, you know, had politicians who were recommending people go to read Marcus Kral's book, watch his YouTube um, shows, which would get hundreds of thousands of, of views within days of being posted in March, April, and May of 2020. And he is relevant because he's matched his vision of, of sort of monetary collapse, not only with the kind of self-interested project of selling you the only remedy against the crisis which he predicted was coming, but also a kind of elaborated political worldview as well. So most notably, he suggested that there needed to be what he called a bourgeois revolution within which, um, again, most notably, if you received any sort of estate support, you know, a pension, um, if you were poor or disabled and you received some sort of bursary or subsidies from the government, if you were a civil servant, if you were a student on a government scholarship, you forfeited the right to vote. So democracy should only be a right of people who um, abjured the, any kind of a state dependency, as he called it. I mean, you know, anyone who stayed, spent 10 minutes in a political economy class knows that anyone who's an entrepreneur is profiting in all kinds of indirect ways from state spending. But the, the ideology was this, that there is a kind of 50% of the population, makers, takers, et cetera, who are parasitic on the state and therefore have no right to participate in the democracy. And this is a strong strain within far right discussions in, in Germany and, and Austria and Switzerland, often overlooked in a discussion of sort of populism, which suggests a kind of welfare chauvinism along the lines more of what Marine Le Pen just ran on in France. But in the German speaking countries, um, far right movements tend much more towards this kind of a thing, a kind of anti-poor, anti-democratic, um, anti-fiat money, and often a kind of a, a, kind of a, a very austere, uh, fiscal, like hyper fiscal, fiscal dis discipline model rather than a kind of uh, reversion to a more generous social state. So, I'm running low on time. Those are my so those are my first two crack up capitalists, the kind of startup society entrepreneurs, the gold bugs predicting, you know, imminent collapse. A third group I'll just mention briefly is the the Corona skeptic movement in Germany, you know, the place that I in a way know best or that I that my my training is in. The the Corona skeptic movement was led by something called the Kvedenka which can be translated as kind of diagonal thinkers or sort of thinking outside of the box. And they're often depicted in the media as a kind of spontaneous reaction against the, against the lockdown measures. I mean, depicted very unflatteringly in the media, but depicted as a kind of, you know, a grassroots, something like the gilet jaune of the, of the, the coronavirus moment, people um, spontaneously expressing their discontent for what were often described as you know, erroneous or misguided reasons. But missed often in the reportage, and I would say this is true of most of the ways the kind of COVID skeptic anti-lockdown uh, movements have been narrated or reported is there's often, there's missing these sort of, these hinge figures who we, me and my co-author Will Callison call movement hustlers, or you could just call sort of ideological entrepreneurs policy entrepreneurs, people who kind of organize that ambient discontent, you know, bundle it, give it some kind of a, give it some kind of a shape, 
and then often you know are critical in making it not only more effective but also in, in producing its own momentum in the case of this the german movement this movement querdenken which is a term that is very much like a kind of uh, early 2000 sort of tech term, right? It, it, in that sense, it's very much like thinking out of the box. It's something you might see on a PowerPoint slide or on a kind of like a low energy kind of piece of, of PR for uh, for a you know, recruitment firm. So the person who sort of coined the term and attached it to opposition to the coronavirus measures was himself an IT developer, an entrepreneur, had had a bunch of startups to his name, lived in Stuttgart, which if you don't know Germany is one of the richest parts of Germany, and um, copyrighted the term Querdenken in 2020. And in the course of 2020, as he was you know, organizing this grassroots discontent, was taking monetary contributions directly by PayPal or bank transfer to his account and was legally describing Querdenken as an initiative rather than a foundation so he could avoid taxes on the donations. So this can be replicated from country to country. The people who are, it's not to say that they don't believe in it themselves, they could very well have um, profound convictions about the, the dangers of the vaccine or the, the long-term psychological harm to children that lockdowns and masking, and masking has performed. It's not to question that, that people believe this, or even in some cases that there is some legitimate foundation to their concern, but that the people who are the middle middlemen and middle women are often have a vested interest in, in pushing this towards ever less conciliatory or ever less sort of compromise uh, capable forms of opposition. And I think that that form of kind of crack up capitalism really thrives on the internet. It thrives in the kind of silos of of social media, it thrives in the sort of you know paid webinars and paid substacks and paid newsletters that um, induce people entrepreneurially to incite more emotional response um, as the last kind of hit sort of phase, right? So the the, the radicalizing tendencies of social movements are well known; have been studied for for decades. But I think the kind of augmentation of social media platforms onto social movements um, is something that has a, a, a sort of a, a combustible quality that is often not lasting, is often not sustainable, but it can produce these sort of pyrotechnic moments that um, are also very profitable for those people who manage to kind of capture capture the, the energy and the, more importantly, the funds and um, skim off their fair share in the process. So I think that it's probably a good place to leave it there. So leave us some time to some time to chat. But I wanted to just give a kind of a, a little bit of an insight into what I think is the, the, the palette or the tableau of some of the more the more extreme forms of um, political morbid symptoms that we're seeing in our, our present tumultuous moment. So thank you.